Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one I'm going to be going through Ave Nox, which is a system neutral mega dungeon for OSR games by Alex Coggin and Charles Ferguson Avery. This is uh, the file 1.0 of the kick for the Kickstarter backers. It just came out. Uh, I don't even think this is yet available to buy anywhere and uh, you can't leave pledge for it. The book itself isn't out yet in terms of a physical copy. This is really just brand new. It, the file has just been released and it is version 1.0. So there might be still some errors and corrections and things to change, but I wanted to get you guys, if you're not already aware of this, I wanted you to be made aware of this and to check it out um, as soon as, you know, keep an eye on it. Um, I'll put a link below to the itch.io page where you can find this and I'll also put a link to the Kickstarter just so you can keep an eye on it. And, and hopefully get it as soon as it becomes available, because it is fantastic. If you know Into the Weird and Wild, Into the Sesson Citadel, which is what Alex and Charles have done before, then you'll know that this, and if you like those products, then you'll really like this, because it is dark, it is grotesque, but it's also brilliant, and it's got these really evocative ideas. The art is not always just horrific. I mean, it's often very, very, it's always good, um, but it has a tone of horror to it, and, uh, and it's sort of body horror, especially, you know, psychological horror. Um, it's a mega dungeon uh, of a fallen city that went down the wrong path. And, uh, and it is really, really fascinating. Cool world building, a lot of great ideas. And it's just one of those books that's worth it to read through. And I just want to like, I just want to read through this whole dungeon because it's so interesting and it's so intriguing. Uh, it's just, it's like Into the Weird and Wild in that way where uh, even if you don't run particular elements of the book, you just, you're drawn in by the fiction and by the art and by the tone. So good. So uh, I'll, I'll click through this. It's a 208 page PDF and uh, there's just a lot to it. It's jam packed full of stuff and ideas. Um, it's dedicated to not making Hazel to cats. It's very cute. So here is the book, uh, the, uh, the chapter um, breakdown. As you can see, it's 203 or 203 pages uh, or rather before the appendices totally, but it's 208 pages in PDF form. Um, it's not hyperlinked. Maybe they'll do that eventually with the final product, uh, the final PDF, but the 1.0 is not hyperlinked. Um, that would be nice. I would actually, that's one thing I, I would hope to see moving forward. But I know that would increase the size of the file, but even so, it would be nice to have it, even if it's just on this first, you know, um, uh, you know, catalog. What do you call that? Um, table of contents. There it is. I found it. <laughs> even if just on the table of contents. Um, now, all said and done, it's over 150 keyed entries, not rooms. Some of them are, are really big areas and they have a couple like entries per area, but mostly they're individual rooms. And so it's 150 essentially rooms. So it's a mega dungeon, but it's on the scale, it's on the smaller side of mega dungeons, which is actually preferable most of the time. You know, I, I really like Arden Vol. I'm, I'm going through that myself and just reading through it. I'm not playing through it, but I'm reading through it. I love that one, but it's sort of, you know, so big, you're just never gonna see it all. A dungeon like this is something that you could reasonably present as a campaign and get through the whole thing with a party in a reasonable amount of time. So I think that's going to appeal to some people who, who otherwise are going to be turned off by Art and Vol and, and Mega Dungeons on that scale. Um, so you get a first page of System Neutral and what that means, and that's really helpful, especially because this is... They had this page, I think, in uh, Into the Weird and Wild and Into the Sess and Citadel, and it's really useful in both of those books. It's very useful here, too, because we get very particular room descriptions and creature descriptions and things like that. So even though it is system neutral, um, it's not it's not statless, right? You still have to do some conversion to your system of choice. And I think that's uh, you know quite interesting, but I'm glad that it's here. So we get a brief rundown of the timeline of Solus, which is the city of Solus, and uh, it's sort of the place you're eventually going to be investigating under under the earth, uh, and a breakdown of what happened here, and uh, oh, look at that art. See, I mean, this one, I mean, there's so much great art here, and it plays with dark, the light and shadow in a very interesting way, because light here, it's called Ave Nox, right, so hopefully you'd think Hail Night, right, in Latin. You'd think it would, it would have something to do with uh, that motif throughout, and it absolutely does. Kind of the big bad that you're going to be facing is the Sun King, basically. <laughs> But this, this, this piece of art, and art like this throughout the whole book, is one of the reasons to get this thing. It's so good, and so draws you right in. I love the little tyrant graffiti on the bottom of it, which definitely fills in with this, uh, this whole thing. Um, timeline continues, and then you get the setting in which this dungeon is found, the ghost fields. So it's this big desert, and there's lots of tribes and lots of, you know, you know 
convoys that go through and caravans that go through, and there's a very, very few, if any, except, well, there's one permanent settlement here that you're going to be going back to, I think. The village is pretty cool, and it's, it's, it's fairly well detailed. Um, you get the various locations uh, that players are going to need to know, right? Uh, different shops and things like that. And then you get the uh, NPCs that are going to be here too, and I love the art for them. Eziak, Vimos, Jezoa, Asa. Now, one of the things that's interesting here is that the names of the not the names the um, the the ancestries, the races of the of the different um, people in town are very clearly like five E inspired. You got like drow, goblins, tieflings, gnomes, orcs, um, humans. Assuming that that, that one figure is human, but it's more like five E races. So this is system neutral. Obviously, it could be open to five E. Definitely. It would probably take more work to convert it to a 5e game, I think. Um, but for any OSR game, it's going to fit right in. You could change, obviously, the races of the creatures if you want to fit them into your world in, in an easier way. But there's a sort of, again, an implied setting here, and it's more broad in its um, in its scope in terms of the races and things like that. You get random locals uh, and merchants and what they might be selling and what they might want in terms of going back and selling to them. I think that's really cool. Um, and then you get mercenaries, different NPC companies. The Sun Beetles, McMallon's Expedition, the Lucky Daggers, Fox Company, the Alabaster Tower, great evocative adventuring company names and who's part of it, and then where they might be found if you want to run into them during the adventure and what their conditions are when you run into them. So you could use them as hirelings, the book says, you could use them as rivals, you could use them as encounters, however you want to do it. Um, that's cool. I always like rival adventuring parties in the game, it's, it's a great idea. Then you get some new backgrounds for your characters. I thought these would be great for Shadow Dark. They would really help, because I'm thinking always of Shadow Dark these days, because that's what I play. Um, one of the things that Shadow Dark doesn't, I mean, doesn't prohibit is adding extra abilities into your backgrounds. And some of these are really cool. They're, they're, they're very um, easy in a lot of ways. I mean, they're, they're very minor. But in the one specific case, they're pretty good. So like the begrudging spelunker is can see in low light for up to 10 minutes. That's pretty good with your eyes sort of adjust there. Or can carry double the amount of remains, the loathsome grave robber. So maybe, uh, you know, every other remains that you considered you're holding don't count in your inventory in the Shadow Dark terms. Whatever you do, these would be pretty easy to convert, in other words, to to real, really any OSR game, but I think Shadow Dark would be easy um, with these. The Exile Descendant, the Desperate Fool. <laughs> and the story so far, how the dungeon has opened up, and essentially it's just very recently been discovered. That's interesting. So this isn't like Arden Vol and other, me other mega dungeons like um, Castle Centillon or even Barrow Maze, right, where there's just generations of expeditions that have come through. Uh, this is a brand new opened dungeon, and so there's just you're one of the first to go down. Um, you and the other adventuring parties. And one of the things that happens here is you kind of have a sliding scale of reputation with the ghosts down here because there's lots of ghosts and stuff. And so if you do things to help them, you bury them, you return their bones to the surface, you get more positive reactions from the ghosts. And if you loot and if you desecrate and if you do bad things, um, then you start to get negative reputation with the ghosts. And so um, instead of having to roll for reputation, the ghosts can always perform their listed friendly action, for example, if you're always friendly, or uh, they're neutral, and you have to roll for it, um, otherwise do not interact, or they might be angry. So as you run into ghosts down here, depending on what, how you've been treating, how you've been pro proceeding, um, you'll have different reactions. That's kind of cool, sliding scale there. Gas lines is an interesting idea, so the technology of the city had powered gas lines, and so you have lights, but there's, you know, um, you could break the gas line and then fill things with, you know, gas that can't live and he can kill you if you try to breathe it. Um, broken gas lines and how to interact with that. So it's interesting um, and igniting it, right? You can you could use that to your advantage if you if you figure out how to do that. Uh, but you'd also be very careful. It's a cool element to the dungeon and, and e each of the areas will have notes about the gas lines there if they're open or if they're intact or broken, whatever it is. Get some extra particular kinds of locks throughout the dungeon and some special features that you can find throughout, like the locks, the pipe merchant, which is great. You bang on a pipe and eventually this guy comes through a vent and you can sell and buy from him. Well, what is he? It's kind of weird. Feels very video gamey, but I love it and it's very flavorful. I like it a lot. Um, and then uh, Oakle's hand mirror or Oakle. Um, if you find these pieces, you can put it together and the magic item gets stronger. If you put them all together, you let it out. <laughs> it's real bad, but it's really cool. I like this uh, kind of idea of building this magic item as you go through the dungeon. Overview of the hex on the surface and where the entrances are. And then the first descent, the dungeon itself. And this is how it's laid out. I really like the maps. Now, they're not frequent enough for my tastes. And so far, there isn't a map book that I've gotten. There's no map PDFs. Have them separately. You just have to do a lot of flipping. And because nothing's hyperlinked, you can't do it quickly. So that is one thing that I, I, I would probably change. 
or I would like to see as a, a map book or a hyperlinking or again more frequent maps. I don't think they'll change that element because that would probably change the whole layout of the book but there is a lot of flipping. You have to maybe if you're going to open up uh, what I would do is open up multiple files and keep the maps open as you go through. But you get the first level and how it's laid out here. Um, there, there is some issues in terms of layout here like so for example um, you see that A, B, and C are all listed on the map. B is on the other page in the PDF. It'd be nice to have it as a spread. You just have to click back and forth just to even see the names there. Um, but that's okay. It's not the end of the world, obviously, right? Um, just there, there are some things that are just, it's not the, it's not the, it's not my favorite layout in terms of maps and dungeon that I've ever seen. It's, it's totally okay. It's not a big deal, but for a mega dungeon, you really want to think about, you know, making it as easy as possible for, um, flipping back to maps and for not having to flip back and all that stuff and it, it just it, there's a lot of that going on so you know really a quibble compared to how cool the the rest of the book is but I think it is um, it's worth noting again what I would do is I would just have an, a separate file open if I were going to run this online and uh, and just keep that file of the maps open as I play uh, you get the the descriptions of the rooms themselves and they're laid out quite well with bolding and with uh, you know um, side information put in it in a very clear way, you know, set off to the side at times. And really great, again, just the descriptions of these places is so evocative and cool. A2, the creation mosaic. I'll read through this. Light catches a wall of glittering glass tiles. Covering the wall and stretching dozens of paces wide is a mosaic of beatific images of a sun-headed figure overseeing a city. The enormous mural depicts the following scenes. A larger-than-life Solaris Rex pointing to a darkened and swirling sky surrounded by panicked mortals. Countless mortals digging and constructing a vast structure the direction of Solaris Rex. So that's, you know, again, this is 1.0, so there are going to be some errors. This is a double A there, AA. They'll probably be corrected, I'm sure, in the final. I would imagine things like that would be corrected. Solaris Rex stretching their arms out to protect the city and all of its inhabitants from a nameless and swirling darkness in the background. Used as a form of propaganda and an artful way to remind everyone who saved them from calamity. Spot. Hundreds of tiny graffiti marks pepper the surface at eye height. Mostly curses, insults, and the word tyrant. So this one creation mosaic, this one image here, gives you a ton of information about the background of this place, about the political, if you will, connections between the factions, and uh, of the surviving NPCs, what their relation might be to Solaris Rex and to each other. So there's this view of a savior, lord, but then other people see him as tyrant and, and villain. And you have sort of a, I don't know, a... Uh, <laughs> a uh, this reminds me of like what do they call that Soviet um, mural the, the impressive brutalist like propaganda that they would put on the, it just reminds me a little bit of that <laughs> that that sort of over the top uh, thing and in case you see it with like you know the ancient Egyptians too it very much brings that to mind uh, but anyway really cool really really cool here um, and I think it, it makes a lot of sense terrifying art as well. And that's another thing you're going to get as you go down deeper and deeper and deeper is more and more horrifying things. There's the Summer Cult, which is this, uh, you know, active faction in the dungeon. One thing I wish they would have put earlier on is maybe like a faction breakdown because you kind of have to pick it up as you go. But that is something that's going on here is there's a, a solar or summer cultist, <laughs> summer cult doing all this stuff. Um, and you know, again, just creepy creatures that are devolved and mutated and changed by what's going on down here and having survived. There's a little bit of science in here rather than just magic. And so, you know, some some people aren't going to like that so much. Now, I don't think this is, yeah, you can't click these off, but um, but you could, you know, tick them off if you had a book or if you just wanted to, you could do it by editing the PDF, I'm sure. Uh, but it's not, it's not form fillable, it's not clickable, just based on the PDF I have. But again, this is version 1.0, so they might change things as they come closer to a final release when you know, for a product you can buy. Um, I'm sure it's pretty close, though. Um, yeah, so if your tone isn't... If you're not super into the whole... Um, a little bit of science fiction, a little bit of technology in your fantasy, then this probably won't be the Mega Dungeon for you, because there definitely is like things like gas lines, as I mentioned before, and uh, things like that. So there's, there certainly is a, a little element of that, but it's not it's not immense. It's not it's not like a, a futuristic setting or something like that <laughs> or anything, uh, but it is a, a, a much more advanced society that's now fallen, right? Uh, you get the next, next area, and uh, King Linorm. Every seven days, an enormous hagfish called King Linorm emerges from its lair to feed, page 74. 
On such a day, the monster follows a routine path, moving from location to location as seen on the map every D3 hours. It attacks and consumes whatever is convenient, giving chase to the closest living thing. At the end of the day, or once its appetite has been sated, satiated, about two to three adult cows worth of meat, it slithers back to its lair sleeping for another week. And you see its path through there. So if you happen to run into it during its uh, during its transit, and this is a mega dungeon, so you're probably going to be coming back and forth, and most likely will at some point run into it on its path. You can see where it's going to go and where it's coming from. As you can see, the rooms are not that big, and there are many entries per room often. So that's why I say this isn't exactly a mega dungeon in terms of like massive scale. In terms of actual rooms that you're investigating, it's it's not even all that big. But um, in terms, but in terms of key locations and in terms of you know interest and how long it would take to investigate, it's definitely on the mega dungeon scale. So <laughs> look at that great piece of art there entering the pipes, uh, the work hall, and more maps there. And so this is this is a good example of what I mean about layout. Um, I love that piece of art. Don't get me wrong, but putting a piece of art in between a two-sided spread map is a bit confusing to me. So again, there's some choices about layout and design that. About the layout that I I, I, I wouldn't do <laughs> if I were designing this book or, you know, if I had my say. But again, overall, these are quibbles because the map itself is beautiful. The art itself is beautiful. And it's fairly fine. You can just, you know, flip a couple pages and it's not the, not the end of the world by any means. So I don't want that to be, you know, something I keep harping on. And it is like, it's the thing that I can point to as something to change because the rest of it is just so good. Um, the work hall... Again, these creepy creatures, they, they're like things out of a, a really dark Ghibli, right? That's kind of how I think of them or something like that. Like the darkest side of Studio Ghibli. <laughs> Knife man. The creatures here are, are very bizarre. This is certainly coming out of a tradition of certain kinds of dungeons that are way more really dark. I mean, like you're going down into the, like, you know, this is evil and it's twisted and it's really nightmarish. And that's kind of what you're getting the further down you go into this dungeon, is more and more nightmarish things. Um, that's, that's not to say that it's not... Well, actually, perhaps because of that, it's incredibly... Um, like, it draws you in. <laughs> right? It draws you in. I love this right here, by the way. So you see the transition of the mural, right? It's like, oh yeah, it's all nice, and it's all growing, and then, and then you see the room. And it's like overgrown and creepy and you don't want to go in there right <laughs> so I, that's the sort of whole place is that there's an element of brightness and majesty and then you go in and it's horrible um but there's great ideas about fungus creatures in here there's the fishery hall with the uh the hagfish and uh if you want to go down here and fight the hagfish you can't definitely can king linorm is tough 20 hit dice so you're looking at a very tough fight in terms of any old school game it's such a great piece of art there i love that Storage hall and ledger room, the drying barn, you're moving back through the wet storage the pickles are. <laughs> a creature living in the jar screams its name as it leaps out to make a surprise attack. Pickles are edible. Fermento. A horrid creature with the body of a hagfish but face and limbs of a toddler. Ugh. Creepy. Water tanks. The freight lift with the solar guard. They're really cool. And that looks like something out of, I don't know, Dark Souls or Elden Ring or, you know, definitely that that side of things I, I get. <laughs> the Living Quarters, more dungeons here. Oof. Creepy Solar Summer Cult. And they look so good with that fake smile. And it's really good. Really creepy. Draws you right in to what's going on here. Again, I think that this is not going to be to everybody's taste, right? Some people are just not going to like this dark element to a dungeon. I'm not sure I'm ever going to run this, I have to be honest, because I don't, I mean, I like reading this, but it leaves me like kind of creeped out. And I, my players are certainly not in this, they're not in this mood <laughs> for long enough to play a mega dungeon. Like sometimes some of my players really like elements of this sort of stuff, this sort of creepy, this sort of nightmarish stuff. But that's why I, um, I, I try to like bring in stuff, for example, but as briefly from books like Into the Cess and Citadel or Into the Weird and Wild using those as like the, the the full diving in and immersing yourself in that for a whole campaign my players would not be down for that so again i don't think i'm ever going to actually run this full on but in terms of taking ideas from it or running sections of it or just using it as inspiration tonal inspiration using it just as fun to read right i i enjoy reading well-written adventures that have a very powerful tone just on their own um 
Oh, look at that. <laughs> That's the eyes in the dark. A pair of disembodied eyes float before a wall of creeping darkness. Their centers burn with a cold hate. That's creepy. I love it. I love it, but it's real creepy. And there's lots of really good ideas for monsters in here, too. Again, if you just want to take this book as inspiration. Oh, yeah, the obsidian mirror. Uh, lying on the ground is the broken remains of Oikul's hand mirror. That's the, the magic item mentioned at the first page. So you can only see his reflection in the mirror. And so as you put more of the parts of the mirror, the more fractured, the fragmented pieces back together, you can see more and more of him. Yeah, really cool. Great idea. Um, as you get down further and further, obviously, as I said, things get darker and darker, but in a way they also get brighter and brighter <laughs> because you start to deal with the actual um, king, Solaris Rex. So you're going through kind of like the, the, the you know, the broken pits and the, the ruined sections of the city and all that stuff, but eventually you get to the um, the court of the king himself, and then it's all very different. It's not this sort of rebellion against him. It's like the, the last remnants of his tyranny. Creepy mutants here. Oh, and then the thin one. This is a really creepy guy. He can become, if you do the right thing, if you know what you're doing, you can make him into your companion, into a loyal henchman, basically. Which is really creepy. <laughs> to have a sadistic, immortal, ghoulish henchman who's very loyal to you. But you can do it. Um, look at that piece of art. Oh my goodness, I love that. That looks like something out of... You know, I don't know, the um, never-ending story, right? Or, or like a dark version of the never-ending story. Or like something out of Hollow Knight, again. Or, or these, 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 it's so evocative. Something out of Ghibli. I just love that piece of art there and that creature. That's a good one. The pumps of the place. You've got to be careful with the pumps. Lots of things that you're dealing with here. Winter shrine, the winter, the winter halls. Then you get to the solar palace itself, and there's like... Uh, different villas that are attached to it, greed, gluttony, slo sloth, sloth, and then um, I think there's uh, excess as well as one of them. Um, and the royal gardens, the overgrown, the creatures that are inside the villa of greed is a great idea. <laughs> Serdati. Uh, a towering naked mortal with golden skin and a magpie's head. Their ruby eyes peer menacingly as a piercing caw explodes from their beak. So the leader of the villa of of uh, greed is a magpie, <laughs> or is a magpie head. That's awesome. Yep, great piece of art there. The Villa of Excess, Euphoric Atrium. It's this horrible, uh, yeah, maggot thing that is just giving itself over to hedonism. And then Sloth, or Sloth. The Sorcerer Hall, there's erratic magic there, and the Curio Hall. And then you finally get down to the uh, Court Wizard, Guidance of Light Ritual, and then the Sun King Domain, which is sort of the final final fight area, where you're going up against the final boss of the Sun King himself. Um, a zealous many. A misshapen skeleton constructed of mismatched bones and adorned with a battered sun mask made of hammered bronze. It's a great idea. And then the throne, the solar sanctum, child of the new sun, and Solaris Rex, the Sun King. He's a tough, tough fight if you're going to fight him straight up. He's got gifts of fire, resurgence, regenerates up to 100 hit points. Um, up to five times per day. He's one of the four. So just heal up to 100 hit points five times per day. Maybe you can only use each once. Either way, that's really hard as an attack. So this guy's going to be almost impossible to kill if you fight him straight up, I think. <laughs> so you're going to have to find a way to destroy him. But he's like a god king, right? He's like a demigod. So it makes sense that he'd be very, very, very hard to fight. And once you destroy him, then the thing that's powering him can appear and offer you a deal. And if you don't take the deal, bad stuff happens to the uh, the region. Then you get the, the cutaway of Solus, which is, as you can see, as a mega dungeon, it's pretty small, right? You've got the four levels done the one way, you've got the Solar Palace and the Solar Sanctum on the other. It's very much pretty linear in that one way. Gas line status, where they are, you can keep track of it as you go through, which is pretty cool, and a breakdown of all the different rooms. And that's it for the whole PDF. So I think Avenox is a fantastic Mega Dungeon in terms of its tone, and its, its flavor, in terms of its layout. There are problems with the maps and with the hyperlinks and things like that, which I wish, you know, were there or, you know, were, were slightly different, but it's just really equivalent with the, the consistency, the coherency of this, of this book as a, gosh, as a tonal piece, <laughs> as a Mega Dungeon. If you're into the, if you and your party are into the, you know, Dark Souls, Elder Elden Ring, um, 
into the weird and wild, into the Assassin's Citadel style horror behind things. Uh, with a little bit of whimsy in there. I mean, like, there's some funny things that are good, like dark humor is definitely a part of this too. If you're into that in the party, then you're just going to love this Mega Dungeon. But if it's if it's not your bag, or it's not your party's bag, they're not going to want to spend this much time in kind of that level of horror, then or that level of kind of grotesque, you know, uh, dungeony stuff. Um, then I still think that I still think this is a great book in terms of inspiration and in terms of just fun reading. So I highly recommend you guys check it out. Uh, again, it's not something you can get right now, but I'll put links below to where you can keep an eye on it. And if it's the sort of thing that interests you, again, uh, you should you should definitely pick it up. All right, guys. Well, I hope this has been interesting, and I'll see you all in another one.